Welcome to Around BCC. I'm Keith Tebow. The leaves are falling at a more rapid clip. There's a nip in the air. That means it must be November, a little past the midway point of the fall semester here at Bristol Community College. First up this month, it's well known the struggles facing state and local government agencies because of the country's economic crisis. But fortunately for BCC, the Commonwealth has stepped up to the plate to ensure students are not left behind because of a lack of financial resources. And that was bolstered last month by a visit to the Fall River campus from the Massachusetts Secretary of Education. As part of his ongoing tour of state colleges and universities, Education Secretary Paul Revel stopped at BCC to meet with faculty and students. While here, Secretary Revel announced that the state has directed an additional $1.2 million in federal stimulus funds to Bristol Community College. Over the last two years, the state has funneled $5.7 million to BCC. Secretary Revel says using federal stimulus money to bolster all state colleges and universities shows a commitment by the Commonwealth on how it values higher education. That what we have to grow and sell in this Commonwealth right now is talent, is brain power. That's what makes us competitive. It's not natural resources, it's not climate, in spite of the lovely day we have today. Uh, <clears throat> it's not cost of living here, as you all know, but it's brain power. It's we have workers and, a, and human capital in Massachusetts that's smarter, more able, more capable of solving problems that others around the world are unable to address. That's why companies will expand here, that's why companies will come here, and that's our work going forward. Revel believes that the investment in higher education is imperative in ensuring students and faculty adapt to the needs of an ever-changing workforce. How do we organize it in ways that are more effective and efficient? How do we be responsive um, to our employers, both present and future in the Commonwealth. How do we finance it, given the structural limitations in our state's budget going forward, our pension obligations, our health care obligations? What degree of autonomy and flexibility and entrepreneurship ought to be given to campuses in exchange for their fulfillment of a public mission? A public mission broadly defined as creating educational opportunity and excellence for those who might not have an, or an opportunity to get access to that um, educational advantage if they were just on a private market by itself. Revel also feels that community colleges like Bristol can play a key role in ensuring student success. We feel community colleges have an absolutely pivotal role to play in the future of public education in Massachusetts, in the future of the Massachusetts economy. Uh, but the way in which we're currently organized needs rethinking for the 21st century. We're going to need your help in order to do that. We're going to have to work smarter, more efficiently, work differently to get to a more prosperous future that gives you the resources that you need to do the job and responds to the needs of the Commonwealth and our students in a way that's even um, stronger than you're able to do under current circumstances. The infusion of stimulus funds has allowed the college to continue to make higher education affordable for students by not raising fees this academic year. It's also allowed the college for the third year in a row to pledge not to lay off any employees during these difficult financial times. There are fewer places than a college campus where one can find a truly diverse population. And BCC is no different. And now, programmings discussing multicultural issues on campus have become more organized. For years, BCC has presented a number of multicultural events, usually sponsored by a vast number of on-campus organizations. This past spring, the college's multicultural committee was formed to bring structure and organization to all these interests. Committee Chairman Dan Gilbarg says the charge of the group is to work together to provide year-round attention to the issue of cultural inequities. One of the things we're trying to do is to be comprehensive. So we're trying to take, we're trying to look at all the groups that are, uh, who, who are treated unequally in the society and do education around that. That includes racial minorities, it includes women, it includes people with disabilities, um, we're eth ethnic groups. We're trying to hit the broad range. So we're trying to be as inclusive as we can be. 
Native American issues, for example, there hasn't been much done on campus about that. We want to try to do that more. Um, the issue of Islam, we hadn't done much previously on that. We, we wanted to raise that. And so we're looking at a broad range of issues. Uh, we're not excluding anything. As long as we're talking about systematic social inequalities that exist um, in, in our society. Gilbark says that the classroom, surprisingly, is a place where racial issues sometimes arise. You have major inequalities based on race, for instance, and uh, you know a lot of people tend to think that it's because parents don't care when in fact schools treat people unequally. So we want to bring in a speaker to talk about that unequal treatment so that people can then see that in fact we, we shouldn't be blaming people, racial minorities for lower achievement levels. Instead, we should be equalizing the way people are treated so we can equalize achievement levels. BCC graduate Gloria Sadler also serves on the Multicultural Committee and says the college has come a long way in making sure everyone on campus feels welcome. Being a student upon arrival here in 2006, I noticed that the college faculty and staff members weren't ready to readily receive others that weren't similar to them in appearance, if I can say that, if I may. Um, but I have discovered with each year that I've been here, and again, that's since 2006, because of the change at the administrative level, faculty and staff have had no choice but to change. And when you can change the thinking patterns of the faculty and staff, the students are better able to learn. Gilbark feels that by exposing students to different cultures and points of view, they will, by extension, become better contributors to society. In terms of students, we're talking about people that are going out into the community that are going to be working in diverse, work, in diverse workforce. We're talking about people that are going to be voting. So people need to understand these things. And unfortunately, the educational system typically does not teach people a whole lot about it. Um, and BCC itself, oftentimes, people don't learn that much from the regular classes. And so the idea is for us to supplement that uh, by offering really good programming so that people can come out as educated people on these kinds of issues. Sadler agrees, saying minority students who feel comfortable in class will be better in overcoming any obstacle. It means a lot for students to be able to feel much more comfortable and at ease to be who they are and to ask questions because when you're comfortable enough with a faculty member, if you're comfortable enough just sitting in a class being a minority, you can ask questions. You can learn which means you can grow. And in turn, by the time you leave BCC, you're ready to fly. You're just ready to fly. But yet, once you fly, you allow others within the community that have not had that BCC experience to come on in. You'll be readily embraced, is what you want to say before you leave. You'll be readily embraced. The Multicultural Committee will be holding events throughout the academic year at all BCC campuses. There are some who say in difficult economic times come new opportunities. Many people who lose their jobs will take the leap into starting their own business. And BCC can help turn a business idea into a reality. The BCC Academic Center for Entrepreneurship is in its fourth year training students in how to take an idea for a product or service and turn it into a viable local business. Some of the students who benefited from the center's expertise showed off their wares at an entrepreneur fair sponsored by the center last month. Director Jean Girard says the center is a good starting point for students who have an idea for developing a business to seek answers to their questions. What we want to do is certainly build awareness about entrepreneurship. It's a viable career option. And we have a lot of terminal degrees here and then a lot of students that go on to four-year institutions. So we want them to explore the idea of, of entrepreneurship, whether they maybe will start a business, maybe they're, maybe they're in the massage program and they're going to start a massage business and we can help them with that. Or if they want to look at entrepreneurship as a career option or a degree option, build awareness about it, talk to the entrepreneurs, get some feedback from them some of their pros and cons of being in business and, and look at it as a real choice for them, even in this scary economy. <laughs> the center's new training program is called 10 in 10, where 10 students spend 10 weeks learning all aspects of starting a business, from writing a business plan to financing and local permitting. 
Gerard says the program has been successful, with nearly half of all students coming through the center still operating successful local businesses. A quarter of those businesses, the total amount, decided that it wasn't the right time. And that's a really important thing to recognize is that maybe it's not the right time or they don't have enough uh, finances to start a business and they need to take a little bit more time to investigate that and then a quarter is still working on it. So it's very been very successful um, and they're really strong businesses. We definitely have some examples here of people that have done things like food entrepreneurs and consulting businesses and taken their passion and put it into a realistic uh, format. Now we do realize one thing is that 10 weeks isn't enough usually to start a business so it's really just to get the plan started and then it might take them up to a year or more to start that business but we know that at least they're doing the planning and they're going to do it right. Jennifer Sincata went through the training at the center with the idea of producing and selling a vegetable based pasta sauce. She's been in business for about six months selling her sauce in 11 stores and at local farmers markets. She says she knew nothing about starting a business and the center helped her focus on achieving her goal. Well, they were able to point me in the direction of people that could help me in specific areas. Obviously, starting a business like this, there's so many different um, things that you need to, to, to know about as far as jarring it, where to, to actually make it, the licenses and that you need to, to have to, to carry it, what, how to sell it in the stores, how to do you know everything. So they were able to say, okay, you know, you need to find somebody to do the nutritional analysis. Oh, I know someone that can, um, this person does that, or this person can help you with the labeling and the graphic design. And the, so it was just really helpful in them pointing me in the direction of all the different areas that I needed to take care of. Gerard says starting a business is not for everyone, and the center is primarily interested in people who have concrete plans to take the leap into the world of entrepreneurship. We definitely deal with ideal uh, idea explorers, and they can just come into the ACE office one-on-one, -on -one and we can talk to them about their idea. We don't put them into the formal 10 and 10 program unless they really have a solid idea, because it's such a fast-track program, and we have them work on it continuously, have to call their city, their town clerks, to figure out what kind of permits they need. We really make them do a lot of work on the idea. So it's really just about, if they're doing idea exploration, we're happy to talk to them about it. If they just want to bounce an idea off and see what might have to be entailed in that, the most common question we get is honestly about loans and people are you know looking for free money or grants or loans and there's no grants out there unfortunately that's our number one question but there are loan programs out there and we can help them navigate that and see what they have to do to get it in order. In addition to the 10 in 10 program BCC also offers an associate's degree and a certificate in entrepreneurship. For more information check out the college's website or give the Academic Center for Entrepreneurship a call at 508-678-2811, extension 2695. There are many ways to measure student success, but there's little doubt that a student with strong writing skills has the edge over those who need help. That's where the BCC Writing Center comes in. Recently, the center in Fall River went through a renovation with the goal of better serving students of all writing levels. The BCC Writing Center in Fall River has been expanded to bring together many of the college's writing initiatives under one roof. Director Jack Conway says the mission of the Writing Center has always been improving the skills of BCC students. The Writing Center tries to work with students um, in their academic writing and uh, trying to provide them with some guidance to help them become, uh, not only to help their uh, uh, writing, what they're working on to be better, but more importantly to make them better writers so that when, um, if they come to us uh, with a course uh, assignment that is from the English department, our job is to help them with that paper, but more than that is to help them so that when they go to their other classes, whether it's sociology or business, that they can write well there. So we have a twofold uh, uh, operation, helping students with the writing that they bring to us, but also working with students to help them become better writers. Conway says the Writing Center provides students, faculty, and staff with multiple opportunities to improve their literary skills. We're running workshops. We hope uh, we had just did an email to, uh, uh, to all the faculty and staff to let them know that we are going to be making available them, to them in class 
um, workshops on um, the APA style and the annotated bibliography. And that uh, we are also hoping uh, that we can make available to all students um, uh, through e-learning a uh, PowerPoints on things like plagiarism, MLA style, APA style. So we're using everything that's available to us to reach out to students. And I, however, I would have to say that it is the uh, is the professor uh, themselves that really has the biggest influence over students. If they ask them, and we do have professors who give us in advance their assignments and then have their students are required to come here. So that's been the best way of getting students in. Conway says the benefit of the new center was to merge and provide permanent homes for two of the college's student publications, its newspaper and literary magazine. For a long time, uh, Chris Ann Souza, who oversees the um, literary magazine Prevailing Wind, um, was sort of a nomad. They had no office that students could go to. Uh, same thing with the Observer. The Observer had an office that was kind of out of the way and down on the cellar. So what we've basically done here is we've uh, kind of consolidated um, writing, a tutor, tutoring for writing uh, with student publications. And that kind of synergy has a kind of a twofold effect and that is students know where to go if they're interested in the newspaper because we have a central spot and a well uh, located spot and they also know where they can go uh, if they're interested in uh, have a literary bent. The services at the Writing Center are also available to students at the New Bedford campus and the Attleboro Center. Speaking of one of those components of the Writing Center, we introduce you to a new segment here at Around BCC, a look at what's coming up for the November edition of the Observer Student Newspaper. Hi, I'm Sarah Mulvey. I'm the editor of the Observer Newspaper, and here's what we've got coming up in this month's edition. We'll be examining the new Massachusetts state law prohibiting texting while driving and its impact on BCC students. You also might have heard of the television program Law & Order SVU. The Observer will be presenting Law & Order BCC, a look at Chief Wayne Wood and the college's campus security personnel, who they are, what they do, and how they help. Students interested in gaming will get a first-hand look at the new gaming club on campus. And if you have a passion for fashion, the Observer staff will be taking a look at fall and winter student fashion styles. In sports, the Observer will be providing its own NFL power rankings based on students' opinions and a look at the Red Sox recent purchase of a Liverpool, England soccer team. For those just learning to paddle their own canoe, a photo spread on the recent canoe race across the BCC pond will be in store. And as always, we'll have news from the Attleboro and New Bedford campuses. So just be sure to pick up a copy of The Observer at any of the BCC campuses. Hi, I'm Carol Misek lepage class of 1971. Hi, and I'm Eric LePage, class of 1974. I grew up in Fall River in the South End and went to school at St. Patrick's Grammar School although I was a Polish-French gal. <laughs> Used to be in the I Irish uh, plays, and do the Irish jig. And so then I moved on to Mount St. Mary Academy and graduated from there in 1969. Was in the Glee Club and you know, various organizations. I grew up in Fall River, uh, down a Flint section of the city. Later on, I moved over to the Brayton Avenue section and then down to afterwards to the uh, Bedford Street area up towards Eastern Avenue. Uh, I went to school at uh, Diamond Regional. I was in the drafting department. I graduated from Diamond Regional in 1969 and started at BCC. I found out about BCC because I lived in the community. I mean, it was just a very well-known community college with a great reputation. And I majored in secretarial science. I uh, thought that's, you know, as I had been a secretary part-time while I was in school, high school, working at various hospitals, and thought that was the career I wanted to follow. After BCC, I worked for several years as a secretary uh, at Family Service Association uh, in the courthouse, Superior Courthouse, uh, in the clerk's office, and then um, in pretrial services. And while I was doing that, I also started taking some classes at SMU in the evening and decided that I really wanted to further my education with a marketing degree. So then I moved on full time for another two years to SMU. I was at BCC for a year, and I decided that uh, I was gonna get out and go into service at that point. I wanted to change majors. At that time, I was in the engineering department. 
And I think I said I was going to change majors. I'd take a break. So I went to U.S. Navy. I did two years active. And then when I got out of the Navy, I went back to BCC. And I spent one more year there. Between summer classes and night classes, I finished up in one year and got my, my uh, associates in uh, business administration. After BCC, I went on to SMU. I majored in management. Uh, basically, I took uh, man a lot of management courses, industrial relations courses. When I, when I did graduate, I finished up with uh, my degree in business management, but I also had a minor in industrial relations and in mathematics. I met Eric at BCC, most likely in the cafeteria. That's where people would converse and you know gather. And uh, we started dating. And the uh, first date, I believe, was like on a road rally, uh, where you had to follow instructions and, and find items. And you ended up at a party at someone's house in Taunton. <laughs> but that's how I met him. And uh, we just hooked up. And uh, that's it, 36 years later. I worked about 40 to 60 hours a week besides going to school full time. Uh, winter times, we'll say offshore lobster. Well, later years offshore. Well, the first, my first time at BCC, I basically worked uh, cooking at different little restaurants in the area. And then later on, after I got out of the service, I started lobstering offshore. Mm -hmm. And I would gill net codfish in the winter time because it was good, real good money. So I was sometimes put in as much as 40 to 60 hours a week doing that, besides going to school full time. Mm -hmm. How'd you have time for? <laughs> we always fit her in here and there. <laughs> well, the pages got started because we uh, we did okay in the real estate market in Florida when the boom hit, and then we built ourselves another new house in Tiverton, and we had a few bucks extra. And I decided that I wasn't working for anybody else anymore, so I started the pages. We had opened up a Reds Dairy, 1,000 square feet, and what we had was I had a fish market inside there, and we cooked behind the line, and we had 20 seats. Paper plates, plastic forks, right. you know, it was very casual. And we just blew them out of the water. What we did, we did the first weekend in business, our projection for the first month. So it was a tough, but we, I mean, it was tough when we first started. We, we did well, we did extremely well. But it was, uh, we had growing pains real bad. And the, and the building went up for sale. And Red's Dairy was talking about buying it maybe with us. And we didn't want to be in partnership and we didn't want to be a rentor anymore. So. This came. This building became available that we're in now, and Eric said, "Let's go for it. Let's, you know, we can have a lounge. We, we can be a full service restaurant with alcohol, which we did not have at the other location. So it just seemed to make sense." I'd say it's been a roller coaster ride, like anything else in life. Um, it started to take off in the early years. There wasn't much competition in the area, you know, the whole surrounding area. And then, you know, the Applebee's, Pub 99's, oh, and uh, in Dartmouth at the mall, all those restaurants opened. So now we were, you know, there's a lot of competition. Uh, and so that, that hurt, that hurt a bit. And, uh, you know, you just, with my skills and Eric's skills, we just, and our tenacity, uh, you know, what we learned at BCC and everywhere, you know, with our instructors, you just keep going, you just keep pushing. We have given back to the community, and BCC obviously being one of the uh, organizations, We've given back to hospitals, uh, all types of businesses in the area. We um, do a lot of fundraisers. We do, um, we work on site or off site. Um, you know, we'll contribute food. Uh, I, I do a lot of the fundraisers and serve food. Narrow Center for the Arts has their event in September, always at that. Uh, as I said, uh, South Coast Hospital, St. Anne's, BCC, I've been involved with them before. People Incorporated, Make a Wish. Facts and Animal Rescue League. So we get back to the community. You know, you can't just be here and not be involved, you know. And it's cool because we see people we went to college with and, and you know, community college as well. So it's a nice experience. Other news and notes now from around BCC. Getting back to the college's commitment to diversity, the student-led International Club held its annual Map Day ceremony last month, celebrating the over 50 countries represented by students, faculty, and staff here at BCC. The call was all aboard by the BCC Engineering Club as it hosted the first duct tape canoe races on the pond at the Fall River campus. Nearly a dozen clubs and organizations took part in the event, which consisted of building boats made solely out of duct tape, cardboard, wood glue, 
and black trash bags. It came about because our engineering club is constantly looking for ways to raise money. And one of our engineering students from last year had mentioned to us that her alma mater had done this. So we got online, we started looking at it, and we said, this could be fun and it could be something we could do with other clubs. It didn't have to just be engineering. So we saw it as a way to do community building with the uh, whole school, get more teams involved, and also as a way of doing uh, a fundraiser for our club. It was a fun time for all, and the expectation is that this will become an annual event. The college's Institute for Sustainability and Post-Carbon Education sponsored a tree planting ceremony in honor of a global initiative held on October 10th to bring awareness to lowering carbon emissions. Right now we're at 388 parts per million of carbon dioxide um, globally. And we need to be down to 350. That's why the organization 350.org is in existence, to get people to understand that number. And that's the highest number of pots per million we can have and still have a planet that's habitable in the long run for you and me. Well over 7,000 tree plantings took place worldwide in support of this initiative. BCC Health Services sponsored its annual health and wellness fair last month an event that is part of the department's year-round effort to keeping BCC students, faculty, and staff healthy. Health Services has a holistic approach to health care. We also follow a self-care model, which means people need to take it responsibility of getting health care and finding out about the um, services that are available. So this is part of our, um, our mission is to, to let people have the uh, opportunity to find out about what's available in the community as far as health and wellness goes. Nearly 20 local health and human services organizations were on hand to share how they serve the local community. BCC has been added to the list of colleges in the Next Step to Emerson Transfer Scholarship Program at Emerson College in Boston. Under the program, BCC students wishing to attend Emerson can apply for a half-tuition scholarship worth well over $15,000. Eligible students must have a 3.2 GPA and an associate's degree to qualify. Congratulations go out to BCC President Dr. John Spraga, who is being recognized this month by the Fall River Area Chamber of Commerce with its highest honor, the Roger Valcourt Memorial Citizen of the Year Award. In making its selection, the Chamber recognized President Sprague for his successes here at BCC, along with his involvement with dozens of local community organizations. Kudos also go out to BCC student trustee Christopher Wilbur, who has been named president of the Statewide Student Advisory Council, which serves as a liaison between students at all public colleges and universities, including UMass and the State Board of Higher Education. Chris is the first BCC student to be selected for this prestigious honor. That'll do it for this edition of Around BCC. I'm Keith Tebow. We leave you today with a look back at the alumni fundraiser Bonfire of the Humanities held last month in Fall River. Thanks for watching. How's that sound good? Try to picture a girl through a looking glass and see her as a carpet at him. I see her eyes and I stare back at them. See that girl in her own new world. Though her heart is on the surface, she is still the universe. A glory God, oh God, is peeking through the blinds. Are we all here standing naked? Taking guesses at the actual date and time Oh my, justifying reasons why It's an absolutely insane Resolution to live by, live high